You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBGive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBGive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator and your one-stop source for information on giving and reports on the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor, your host. And with me today to talk about education is Dr. Stacy E. Holland, who is the new president and CEO of the Philadelphia School Partnership. Dr. Holland brings a wealth of passion and experience to this space, having specialized in education and college career development for more than 25 years. She's also been involved in philanthropy, where she was the executive director of the Lenfest Foundation, where she managed a $100 million endowment and led the development of early literacy strategy and a career pathway for middle school students. She was also the chief strategic partnership leader for the Philadelphia School District, where she built the framework for the district's thriving network of more than 200 partnerships with local nonprofits, corporations, and government agencies. And she was also the co-founder and president and CEO of the Philadelphia Youth Network, which advocates for post secondary and economic outcomes for children. We're happy to have Dr. Holland here and we'll have a chance to discuss with her what she sees for our young people in the future. Stacy, welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Stacy, you and I have connected recently as a result of your new role as head of the Philadelphia School Partnership. And I've been really excited for you in this role and wanting to have this opportunity to be one of the first to talk with you about the Philadelphia School Partnership, what you intend to accomplish there, help people better understand more about your life that led you to this role and and any, any other thing that may be on your mind as relates to educating our young people. And there's a lot going on in that space right now. So, Stacy, how did you get to education as a career and as really a passion from what I can see in your background? Well, first, let me just thank you for this opportunity. I am very excited to have this conversation today, mainly because I think as we are exploring what the field of education will look like now and in the future, understanding people's journey is critical and how how they've come into this place of what I call learning, right? And so I've landed in this world of trying to discover what it means to be a learner because of my own journey. I was the kid who I call the middle of the cookie. I was a really good kid, involved in all kinds of extracurricular activities, leader, all those things. And silently behind the scenes, my grades were average to mediocre and in some cases just bad. And no one really figured that out until I went to apply for college along with all of my peers and I did not get into college. And so it was a shock to everybody, including my own mom. And so that started for me a lifelong journey and passion of trying to answer the question, well, what happens in school that we somehow miss kids that are in the middle of the cookie, right? We miss a whole swath of young people that are really smart, have a lot of potential, but for whatever reason, they're not really connecting to learning in the classroom. And so that started a 30 plus year journey 
starting out with landing in an equal opportunity program at my alma mater, Trenton State, which is now the College of New Jersey, and being introduced to a world of learning and support that I really had not thought about prior to. And that program really is the reason why I became an educator. I thought I was going to school to be a lawyer. I wanted to you know, go work in the international market and make a lot of money. I had never traveled outside of New Jersey, but someone told me that was impressive. And so that's what I thought I wanted to do. And along the way, I just, I struggled. I struggled all through college, studied a lot, was really tenacious, but never quite figured out what it meant for me to be a learner. And then ended up being recommended to attend a graduate program at Columbia University that focused on student development and specifically looking at minority students and how they develop and then how would they transition and are supported in college. And then I became obsessed. Wow, there's a whole world of kids like me and a whole world of professionals that their whole job is to find kids like me and get them on the path of a post-secondary experience. And so I did that for several years and then realized, wow, this actually, there's a systemic issue. There's a disconnect here. I can get them in the college, but we're not keeping them in college and why. And it really came back to this whole idea of learning. And so I then just focused on, well, how do we help young people and build systemic solutions that one, prepare young people to be learners? And the second, how do we actually then create the conditions within the various learning systems, i.e. K-12 to and or higher ed, that support them and get them to whatever their choice is, whatever that career choice is. And I was seeing myself a lot in the journey as, as I was helping kids and thinking about how to create these programs and systems. I was seeing my own struggle. I was seeing my own disconnect. And I was also kind of struggling and battling with that as well. Once you've been left behind, it's really hard to catch up, specifically after you leave school. So how do we, how do we change that for young people? So many young people are behind anyway because of uh, schools that may be underperforming, their social backgrounds. And we talk a lot about the social determinants of health. We could probably also talk about the social determinants of education. If you come from a poor neighborhood that's not funded very well, maybe if you don't get the right supports, you're going to probably fall behind. And if there aren't significant interventions, then you stay behind. I heard it said some years ago that you could determine where a young person was going to end up in life by the time they were in third grade. (laughs) And that's really sad. But Mm -hmm. for a lot of people, I think it's true. So we need these interventions. What are we seeing, though, in in the field of education right now to help people like you, probably like me, too, because I was also one of these people who was woefully behind when I entered college, what are we doing to to help them? And if you add on the pandemic and Zoom classes that are probably underperforming expectations, what are we doing? What are we going to see if we aren't able to help these young people get caught up? So I think we have to start, first of all, with just acknowledging as a country that our entire educational system, specifically in K-12, is outdated and it's we're still working on an industrial age structure of which we are no longer an industrial economy we are a knowledge economy so we first need to start with the fact of we have to educate people to actually perform and think differently in a whole different global context and i think once we start there this is if we look at covid and the lessons it has taught us One of the things it did was reveal all of the brokenness of our educational system across the board for learners. And I intentionally use the word learners versus students. Our systems are not designed to teach learners, to build learners, to have them discover. It's a science. 
right? How your brain takes in information, how you at the end of the day process that information, how you then push that information out, how you apply that information. And because we are not doing that intentionally across the board for everybody, we are leaving groups of kids behind, specifically those young people who don't have a safety net, right? They're not living in a community that is economically prosperous. Their schools, all the extra supports that those schools have do not exist in our low-income communities, whether it be rural or urban, they don't exist. So now the safety net's gone too. So COVID kind of blew that all up and said, hey, guess what? Not only do you have a problem because your entire structure is outdated, you now have a problem because every community is disrupted. And what are you going to do? And I think there is an opportunity for us as a country and there's opportunity for us, one, to tell some truths that we have been unwilling to address in both at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level, and in local level meaning cities or towns, but also in individual households and in our own informal communities that we've got to rethink the way that we are supporting young people in their learning journey. It's not about test scores. It's not about not about performance and certain benchmarks. That's data and information that tells us where the young person is. But the next step is you've got to be willing, adult, educator, system leader, you've got to be willing to think creatively around how to build experiences and systems that moves that young person through a learning journey. And if we do that well, they will perform on all the tests because I'm not saying you don't need them. They're diagnostic and you need them. But what you can't do is stop there. It now should open up a space of creativity and a space that's like a Rubik's Cube. And when I worked in schools, I literally would find the most challenging kid. <laughs> and it was like, you're going to be my Rubik's Cube. <laughs> I'm going to figure out what the what the challenge is for you, why you don't like anybody, why you have a discipline issue, why at the end of the day they think you're on the verge of dropping out, you're not going to be anything. We're going to figure that out because you are going to be, there's potential in you. We, Our job, my job, educator's job is to unlock that potential. And it might mean I have to try multiple things. And I always found that young person that was the challenge was probably the smartest kid in the in the space. <laughs> they were bored. They weren't engaged. People didn't talk to them. They didn't try certain things to figure out what's going on with you, young person, because they have a whole building full of other kids. But COVID showed us personalized learning, we've got to pay attention to it. Now, how we build those structures, I'm not sure. When you say personalized learning, is that what you mean when you say focusing on student learning or focusing on the learner? Is that what you mean yes. to, to try to make our educational approach more personalized to students as opposed to you're in this grade, you're in that grade, you're moving this way, you're moving that way? What are, what are the differences between what you're discussing and what we're seeing now? Well, I think the first place that I start at around when I think about personalization is we actually have to educate young people around how do you learn best? Are you an auditory learner? Are you a young person who likes to read? Are you a young person? I was a young person that I think in systems. So I draw everything out. This thing leads to this thing, leads to this thing, and you will find anybody that's ever worked with me. I typically have flip charts and whiteboards and sketch pads that are filled with these drawings. And that's how I organize data. I did not know that until I became an adult. <laughs> but as a kid, if somebody had said that to me, it would have been a game changer and taught me how to do it, a game changer. So the first thing we have to do is really educate kids and their families, your young people, they, you know how they best learn. So you've got to, that's number one. Number two, you then have to figure out, well, what are the types of experiences you need to be able to learn? And schools can group those kids together and or find all kinds of approaches, instructional approaches to engage those groups of learners. And the third is you actually have to pay, someone's got to pay attention because they're a young person. And when 
this is why the data is, is tells you something, right? It's a story. When that young person goes off track, you will see it in their data. Something will disengage. The data will dip. And it tells you something's going on with this kid. And we've got to figure out what's going on with the kid. And we have to remember they're kids. So the things that are happening around them, their developmental process of their brain changing and their hormones changing. I used to refer to young people, the walking hormones with feet once they hit middle school. One day you're having a rational conversation and 10 minutes later, they're laid out on the floor crying because somebody said something to them. And 10 minutes later, they're laughing and giggling. So that all shows up in their learning journey. And so you have to build the systems that understand that and then connect and potentially readjust. So the personalization is understanding how they learn and then finding the right match of the learning environment of where they will learn best and thrive best. Now, you can do that within whole schools, but it's got to start with who is this kid. Right. So let's talk about what the schools need to do, what teachers need to do, what systems need to do to enable this kind of individualized learning. And maybe you could give us, if you could, an example or two of maybe places that seem to be getting it right or at least heading in the right direction. So what, what are we talking about in order, in order to convert, so to speak, teachers into these types of, I, I would think they're more like facilitators of education than they are you know, teachers at that point, because I wouldn't think any teacher is going to be able to mm-hmm. know everything that every kid needs to know, but they need to certainly be able to point them in the right direction. Is that what we're talking about or, Is there something different that you have in mind that we need to know about? Well, I attended a professional development with teachers once, and the facilitator, who was a lead master teacher, made the comment of our role has shifted, and you've got to figure out what what you add to the conversation that Google doesn't. So now young people, they're accessing information all day, every day. Right. It doesn't mean they're accessing good information. It just means they can access it. They know how to get it. And so there's a couple of things. One, I have to say, I am in awe of educators that spend their life in the classroom. These are a dynamic, committed group of individuals. Nine times out of 10, they are deeply curious and they're trying to figure out how do I actually connect to every kid in the classroom? But that's if we think about teaching in in an authentic state, meaning all I am responsible for is teaching. The way urban schools have evolved over time, the teacher now has to play multiple roles. So the first thing we've got to do is start creating the conditions where teachers can teach, meaning we put in those other staff support systems to assist that teacher so they are freed up to teach. The next thing is there are already great practices that allow you to figure out individualization. So high schools are organized on, some of them are what's called the advisory model, right? Kids are grouped by cohorts. They meet every morning. There's kind of a debrief. It's a a way for kids to say, hey, this is what's on my mind. It's a way for the teacher to set the tone, for the advisor to set the tone. And that advisor goes with that kid in some schools, all four years, right? It's the caring adult. It's somebody who sees, feels, touch, knows that young person. And so those structures exist. The question is, how can we do them well? And what's needed to do them well? And are they universally adopted, i.e. every kid has a caring adult? The one criticism you will hear that kids will say about why school doesn't work for them is nobody talks to me. Nobody knows me. Nobody saw me, (laughs) right? I disappeared for a week. I didn't get called. Nothing happened. (laughs) Or I stopped talking because I was having this. This thing happened in my life and I was disengaged and depressed. So you have to have, you have to create a structure of somebody sees, feels, touch, and knows you. In the schools that are really progressive in that state, they'll talk about things like, You know, we love all our kids here. We are intentional about knowing who our kids are. And there's an adult attached to every child 
And it's their job to make sure they see and touch, feel that kid, see, touch, feel what they're feeling, and then make sure that we're we're meeting their need. Then there's the other sticky wicket part of this. So if teachers are now facilitators of knowledge and not necessarily deliverers of knowledge, then what are the strategies we can do to upskill them, to get them to use a term in the workforce world, to upskill them on a consistent basis, i.e., how do you engage with virtual learning? <laughs> how can we support you in teaching you how to use the different apps and the different tools and access information and do online projects? And how do we make it proactive because we're trying to move the needle for learning for our kids and not make it reactive because guess what? We're in the middle of a global pandemic and many schools had to convert within days, of which a lot of your workforce may not have ever taught using one-to-one devices and they haven't taught virtually. And for those of us, I've only taught a class here, a class there. I have to tell you, I was traumatized. (laughs) I was traumatized to try and teach in the virtual world. And these were to college students. I was like, can anybody, somebody, somebody turn on a camera? Somebody, who are you? What are you doing? Why can't I see you? I can't engage. (laughs) And you know what? Every single one of those cameras, they're like lady kick rocks. We are not turning on our cameras. So we, we've got to bring them along with the rest of the world and how to use technology, how to access information, how to make it engaging. You know, they're kids, so you have to make it fun. And how to make sure that we are giving them the tools and the knowledge they need to be successful. Yeah. You know, one of the things I always think about, and I'm sure others are too, is how kids are so adept at gaming, video gaming and so forth. Mm -hmm. And they'll spend hours, not all kids, but a lot of kids will spend hours focused on video games. And is there something that we can learn as educators about, I would say the engaging experience that kids have on video games that might make them also powerful learners and successful learning school material. It sort of reminds me of the years ago. I remember years ago in Philadelphia, someone came up with this idea of using rap to educate people. They felt that kids love this rap. So let's just teach using, (laughs) using rap. And I think there were some didactical things that kids were able to learn that way. But it was creative to me because they they said, let's find kids where they are. They like this medium. Maybe there are ways we can use it to to educate them or, or help them become better learners. Well, at the core of that is asking a young person, what's interesting to you? Right. If gaming's interesting to you, then why? And you can actually learn a lot from what kids are interested in. Right. I, I used to run in a center, a community center in North Philly for kids that had dropped out of school and or were on the verge of dropping out. And the goal of the center was to re-engage them, get them back in school, either get them back in high school or get them a GED and do job readiness and placement with them. And I had a group of kids who, first of all, they're like, you do know you're supposed to be in school. (laughs) And their question always was, well, would you like us here or would you like us to go somewhere else? Because we're not going to school. So it's like, oh, okay. So I said, well, the deal is you have to come after school. I need you to go to school. So we made a deal. They ended up going to school, but they could come to the center after school and do pretty much what they wanted. And they would play a very complicated math game. It's like a card game. It was fascinating to watch how they would play this game. And so finally, I just said, well, all of you all are tanking math. How can you play this game? And they said, well, it's not that we're tanking math. It's just we're just not interested. And you never showed us what the relevance was. Why do it? So the first lesson is kids need things to be applied. Why am I doing this? And how am I going to use it in the future? And we have to think about their brains as they're they're these sponges, right? And they're taking in all these little bits of data and they're making choices. Hey, hey. I like the complication and the strategy of this math game. I like the strategy 
of a video game, how can you help me apply that strategy in social studies or through logic or through calculus or pre-calculus? Where's the relevance? So the things they're interested are relevant to them. And thus they will learn a skill that will allow them to apply the skills they're learning. But we've not made school universally relevant. And there are lots of schools that are. They're working. They're designed to make them relevant, right? In Philly, we have the Science Leadership Academy. We have the workshop school. That's a project-based school. And all of the academics are built around real-world real world projects. So kids are working through, oh, you want me to build an entire social media campaign around the Black Lives Matter movement? Great, we can do that. And we're learning about historical civil rights movements. We're learning about what happened globally or internationally in other social movements. It becomes relevant. And so we have examples of how they work. Christo Ray, it's a, a network of Catholic schools nationally. And they figured out, well, you know, if we actually have the kids work during the school day as a part of what they do, we can build out not only a network for the kids in spaces that they typically would not have access to, but we'll also teach them those college and career readiness skills they need. And they're doing real world work. Relevance. Yeah. That reminds me to ask you too about relevance. What what do you see as the role? Is, is there a role maybe for, for business and industry to play in educating young people to connect the dots, so to speak? I, I remember when I grew up, when I graduated high school, I had no idea what I wanted to be. And I looked in a newspaper and I saw that most of the jobs were in accounting. And so I decided I was going to major in accounting. I had no idea what an accountant was. No one ever exposed me to anything accounting related, but that's what I ended up deciding to to be. And I made it forbidden accounting, <laughs> you know, but I wonder what we can do, first of all, to expose young people to different fields so that they can connect the dots between what they're doing in school and how it will turn out for them in life. I think there's so many great careers that students will never have heard of that they could really prosper in. What do you think about that? First of all, I think that is essential to the learning process, right? How do we allow kids to see what possibilities are out there and then see examples and then potentially participate in them to test it? Do I like it? Do I not like it? And so if we think about, you know, the role that business and industry can play, which is critical, and also it's very concrete, right? We're not asking you to reimagine the education system, but here's what we need every professional to do. One, be willing to give back to your local school by just participating in career days, telling your story about this is what it took for me to get from here to here. That's one thing. Second, organizations, businesses sponsor internships. At the middle school, you know, developmentally, you have career exposure through career fairs. Then you move on to mentorship and shadowing days. Mentor a kid. Allow kids to shadow just once or twice a year in your firm at different levels so kids can see different ideas and job pathways. And then as they get older, you know, as a, as a business, you can sponsor those interns and allow them to keep coming back all the way, even when they leave high school through college and or their training. And then most importantly, be willing to build the relationships that allow that kid to say, you know what, if you really like what we do here, we're going to keep in touch with you. So when you're ready to work, we might have a place for you so that you have those connections, specifically kids that are from communities who do not have a social network, right? Mom and dad, auntie, whomever are not connected And so they're just making a way in their world. But if they were in a school that literally created these experiences and or community after school programs that create these experiences for kids to explore and try things, then they can figure it out, right? I started out wanting to be a violinist. I was a violinist as a kid. I competed through college. And my professor finally said, you know, Stacey, you're not that good. (laughs) that you're not that good. At that time, he was looking at me 
Stacy, you're doing very well on the college level, but you're not competitive enough to actually enter into the professional world of classical music. Oh, okay. So I didn't know. The only thing I knew to choose from was lawyer, accountant, teacher. And I had something new introduced because when he told me, Stacy, you're kind of mediocre, not so much. And my response was, my mom said I have to get a job and I only know <laughs> about being a lawyer, an accountant, and a teacher, <laughs> and I don't want to be a teacher. So right. we go off to the registrar's office, and this is why the interactions kids have with adults matter. We go off to the registrar's office, he walks me over there, says, we're going to choose a new major. And I'm like, well, lady, I just need a job. It's just like, well, what kind of jobs do you think you want to do? I only know about a lawyer, a, th- a lawyer, a teacher, and and whatever. And so I said, well, I don't know an accountant. I don't, I'm not I'm terrible at math. I don't want to teach. So I think I should try and be a lawyer. And she says, well, do you like writing? And I'm like, no. <laughs> She's like, well, you're going to be a business major. Okay. Can I get a job? Yes, you can. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, so the ending to my comment is adults exposing and sharing with young people their professional journey. And then schools and communities have to build intentional opportunities for those kids to have access to those organizations are critical. Well, listen, I want to call out some opportunities for people, particularly people from disadvantaged backgrounds who are out there in the workplace now doing things that kids need to know about to find ways into the schools. This is a terrific way, I think, to give back. We're not talking about money, although let's give some money too. But I think it's terrific to go into a school and tell them exactly what you do every day to make a living and talk to young people, find different ways to mentor and and share your experiences. I know there are a number of organized ways of doing that so that, you know, everything's done safely and above board. But I think to get young people more information about career options is is so critically important because it does make that connection. Now, Stacey, I knew this was going to happen. I knew we were going to start talking and we were going to blow by our time. But I wanted to shift, if I could, and have you talk about the Philadelphia School Partnership and your role there, what it tries to do, and what it is that you'd like to see happen during your tenure at the helm of, of PSP. Tell us about PSP. Sure. Well, Philadelphia Schools Partnership, it is a nonprofit that serves as a supporter slash funder of schools in the public, charter, and diocesan sector in Philadelphia. And our goal is to assist schools communities and their students and parents with increasing the quality of those schools and educating parents around the choices they can make in terms of educating their child and selecting a school. We're 10 years old. The organization is at an inflection point. The first 10 years was spent building an additional I would say about 15 to 17,000 new opportunities by helping new schools be created and or expand. And now we're at a point where it's like we've built all these opportunities, new schools, we've strengthened existing schools, and now we'll spend the next hopefully five to 10 years really working on educating the general public and the schools in our network around what best practice looks like to elevate learning for specifically low-income Black and brown children Also discovering some of those core practices that are actually working for kids and spreading them amongst schools. And the third is really helping school communities and focused on parents on what quality is and how they can help their child enroll in a school and stay in a school throughout their K-12 journey that meets their child's needs. And lastly, it's we have to amplify, right? We, We have to pull out those core practices and begin to amplify them, educating, spreading those practices 
throughout the community. So that way we're trying to elevate all the schools that really do need some love and attention and support. We can improve the practice across the board, but we've got to start with how do we actually articulate and call out those core practices that work really well for black and brown kids? Yeah. Well, it's an enormously challenging role, I think, too, because there's so many players that have to come together to make change in education. We know that there are schools themselves, school systems, there are uh, teachers unions, there are parents, of course, parent organizations who have a stake. There's so many different stakeholders at the political environment in which funding flows. How does PSP work to coalesce or form these coalitions to actually get things done? Well, I think first we have to acknowledge that everybody actually wants the same thing. Everybody is working towards a common goal or working on behalf of a common goal of how do we provide the best education possible that prepares kids for life beyond high school. We have to prepare them for post-secondary and more importantly, we're preparing them to be productive citizens. So once you acknowledge that, what you then have to focus in on You know, I call it the the journey of finding friends. (laughs) You have to focus in on who's aligned with you. And, you know, we tend, I've been convening most of my career, and we tend to want to start really huge. Like, my goodness, we must get everybody under the tent. Well, you actually must find some, a few focused friends that are really aligned around the problem you're trying to solve in the moment. Because that's a discipline. Everybody's got to leave leave their ego outside the door. We have to stay focused on solving a functional problem. Everybody's got to be willing to change their behavior. And you've got to be willing to adjust for the greater good of the group. So what we'll do is identify what are the core problems we're, we're trying to solve in the moment? Who are those allied organizations that we need to solve this problem? develop the discipline of what it means to collaborate well. And collaborate well does not always mean you agree. (laughs) It means that you have an intellectual capital that everybody needs and you're willing to put it on the table and struggle through what it means to bring all of your intellect and your resources to solve that problem. And you're willing to fight through the messy with the goal of, did we actually achieve the objective that we came together? With. And I think we will spend a lot of time trying to find those organizations that have complementary intellectual capital and purpose, and then working with them so we can move the needle for as many kids as possible. So here's, you know, we're, we're probably to the end of, of our conversation. I wanted to ask you two questions. First, there's a parent out there somewhere who has a kid who he or she knows is very talented, but who may not be making it in the situation that they're currently in. The parent is frustrated. The kid seems disengaged. What do you say to that parent to keep them focused and and hopeful about where their kid may end up? What do you say to them? That's the first question. The second question I have is, what can we all do to help? I mean, there are a lot of people like me. Our, my kids are all grown up now, and fortunately, they made it through school. What, what can we do? Are there things that we can do as a society, those of us outside of the educational system, to be supportive of our young people going through school right now? Well, the first thing I'd say to a parent is just remind them and that they are they are powerful beyond measure. Parents, you are the best advocate for your child. You know your young person and you know, you understand their needs. You may not have the technical language to make requests, but you have to keep being that advocate and keep questioning. Start at your school. If you don't get what you need at your school, then find organizations like ours. Get on a website, get in that great Philly school's website, which will lead you potentially to a person 
And you keep asking, you keep pushing, you keep questioning. That is the reason why I got in college. My mom said, it is unacceptable that you did not get into college and I'm going to figure it out. (laughs) And I'm going to keep pushing. She didn't necessarily know what she was asking for. She didn't know what an equal opportunity program was, but she knew her kid. And so I would empower that parent first and foremost to keep asking questions and your school, you will find the right person at your school and or in your district and or a partner agency after school program. Keep asking, I need help. I need help. I need help. You will absolutely land on someone who will take the time to hear you and help you navigate. The second is push. There are all kinds of ways to get your kids in the type of school that meets their need. If you have a creative kid, then you might need to get them in a creative arts school, (laughs) right? If they're a technical kid, they might need to be in a career and technical ed program. And that's what I mean about parents. You know your young person the best. So advocate. And even if you ask a basic question, what type of school is available for my kid the way that they learn? What can I do? That would be that first question. And the second question, what can people do? You know, years ago, the organization I was running, Philadelphia Youth Network, ran a campaign. And we kept saying, if each adult actually takes one kid in the city of Philadelphia, at the time we had 180,000 kids in, let's say, the K-12 space, their population is over a million. (laughs) One adult, one kid you can change their life. Just because you see them, you hear them, you're guiding them, and you're posing provocative questions to them, that relationship could be the game changer. The second is definitely find your local organization that aligns with your passion, Boys and Girls Club, after school programs. We have a board member who's passionate about rowing and has figured out ways to support rowing in schools in low-income neighborhoods, support programs like Philadelphia Schools Partnership that are touching and touching schools directly and providing the types of support they need. But we need every adult to get involved. And the last is find a way to share your professional story. Kids think we we popped out of a box of success. They really do. That's how they're right. We have kids that are like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to be a CEO by 25. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, really? Is that what you think happens? Okay, honey. (laughs) And so sharing that journey with young people and the more of us that do it, they'll actually say, wow, you know what? You worked really hard. You know, like someone like myself, I need young black and brown kids to see me an older brown woman and hear my story and know that's possible. Like no one could have told me, I didn't even know it existed, that I would lead multi-million dollar organizations. What's that? Nonprofit? That's possible? And you didn't even get into college, lady? Really? How's that going to happen? <laughs> so they need to see our stories and they need to hear our stories. And I would close on, The reason why that's important is so the institution I did not get accepted into, the College of New Jersey, fast forward 10, 12 years later, I became chairman of the board. So young people need to see that. They need to hear that story, right? And went on to get a master's and a doctorate from top tier institutions. If I told that story in the beginning, they're like, there's no way. So when kids hear that, I see their faces light up. I see their light bulb, their dreaming light bulb comes on. They ask different sets of questions. I see me in you, Miss Stacy. I see that. And that's what each adult, it's a gift you can give every child. Well, we'll leave it on that because that is the gift that I hope all members listening to the Heart of Giving podcast will, will take to heart. We all have something we can do to change or elevate the lives of young people. And I hope we take heed to what you just said. This is the Heart of Giving podcast. I've been interviewing Stacy Holland, who is the new CEO of the Philadelphia School Partnership. And thanks for being with me, Stacy. Thank you. 
And I want to thank all of our listeners and subscribers and donors to the Heart of Giving podcast. We'd also appreciate it if you would give us a positive review, especially on Apple Podcasts, because this will help us build audience. If you want to do a little bit more, you can become a sustaining donor to the Heart of Giving podcast on Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. And also, finally, if you want to reach us, because we'd love to hear from you, please do so on Facebook, or you can just send us an email to heartofgivingpod at gmail.com. Thank you very much. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.